Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the regular council meeting of October 26 to order and ask council to approve tonight's agenda with the inclusion of the new business uh, information that's provided on package one and package two with the exception of UB1 supplementary information, which is 6645-6647 Souk Road. Um, we would just require some more information on that matter. So it'll be RA1, C1, NB1, and 2 and 3, and the supplementary C1. Moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Ray. Any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried. Thank you. All right, so our first order of business is adoption of council and committee the whole meeting minutes from October 13th. Someone like to move adoption? Moved Move by Councillor Casper. Second. Seconded by Councillor Pearson. Any errors, omissions, comments, or questions? All right, all those in favor? Opposed, motions carried. And then we'll do the draft, receipt of draft council committee minutes for information. We have September 24th, the Climate Change Action Committee. October 6th, Parks and Trails Advisory Committee. October 7th, Board of Variance. October 7th, Long-Term Financial Planning. And October 10th, the Hiring Committee. We'll move those in a block. Councillor Berger, seconded by Councillor Ray. Any discussion, any questions, comments, errors, omissions? All those in favor? Opposed? Actually, yeah, that's right. Motion's carried. Thank you. All right, we have two delegations this evening. Uh, I'd like to begin by welcoming TELUS Communications, Mr. Doug An Anastos. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome, I believe you have a PowerPoint. If you could please just come to the microphone there and just press the button there, thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council Members. My name is Chad Marlat. This is Doug here. Um, and. Uh, we're here to talk about a proposed cell site at 6683 Sucro. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to start, I'll give you a rundown of what I'll go through, just a bit of an overview of the wireless trends. A summary, summary of our proposal and then a requirement for the improved service, why is, why is this needed? Over de overview of the details uh, of our consultation and then we'll go through the specifics of the proposal. And we've got a bunch of visuals to show you of uh, what the proposal looks like and uh, other similar proposals. Then we can go through any questions you might have. So uh, basically, driven by the proliferation of uh, smartphones, businesses, governments, people using the phones have uh, really required the increasing need for data on their phones and it's driven driven the demand up quite a bit so much so that uh, networks sometimes increase at a rate of five percent per week so a cell site needs more more uh, data traveling through it uh, than it ever did before and sometimes uh, I think on average um, networks are handling twice as much traffic year over year that means that uh, basically we need more and more cell sites to offload all of the data requirements of our network so people can still use their phones efficiently, not getting drop calls or sole upload and download of, of data and or not being able to make voice calls altogether. Uh, it should be noted that 70% uh, of all 911 calls are now coming from mobile phones, so it's very important to have a robust network for emergency purposes. Uh, the graphic down below just sort of goes over um, how much more than a voice call does a smartphone use, does a, an e-tablet reader or somebody using the internet over wireless? And you can see the numbers. If you have a smartphone, you're using, you, you need more, 35 times more uh, than you would from a regular voice phone. And if you're using a laptop for internet, it's almost 500 times more. So there's a lot of need for improvements in our networks to keep up with the demand that people are looking for throughout their neighborhoods. So why are we here? We're proposing uh, a new cell site at uh, TELUS's CO at uh, 6683 Souk Road at the rear of the CO. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Uh, we're proposing a 15 meter shrouded uh, monopole and all the equipment needed to operate it would be located within the CO itself. There'd be a small fence built around it, but that's about it. It would just appear as a, as a pole. 
So why is the service needed? Uh, this map, well, it's very simplified. The one on the left here, sorry. The one on the left uh, shows areas of uh, basically white that have poor service and then areas of green that have improved service if the cell, cell site were installed. So basically this area in here, and this is a very simplified map, but this area in here would have much more improved service as does the area down here in East Souk and then uh, a spit that's coming out down here that's just off this map. The, uh, I can't recall the name of the spit off the top of my head right now, but it would have improved service as well. So I know this is, is very simplified, but you can see the green area with a lot more improvement throughout the area and the, sort of the greater village area. It would also be improved up on the hillsides as well. This is, like I said, very simplified, but you, you'd see a great improvement of service. The existing cell site that we have is over here uh, in East Souk that's servicing the area, and it's about 3.5 kilometers away. If we really want to improve service, we need to have antennas located more closer to where people are using their phones uh, to have some optimal service improvements. So I just want to go through a summary of our consultation to date. We, uh, we began the consultation in uh, August of 2014, quite some time ago. Uh, we notified residents, we notified uh, about 52 residents uh, within 100 meters of the proposed installation. We allowed 30, 30 days for comments, um, and I think it extended a few months by the time we were conversations were done with some of the members of the public. We've provided responses. Uh, in total, we had uh, only four people make comment on the proposal, which is uh, fairly low. The nature of the concerns uh, that were brought up were either health and safety or the visibility of the poll itself. Um, We've then, most, most recently, we've requested concurrence uh, for the proposal. That's why we're here this evening. We'd like uh, the buy-in from council to, uh, to complete the installation and improve service to the community. Uh, as I mentioned, there was four comments made from members of the public. Um, they were mostly to do with health and safety, and I don't know if you're familiar with Health Canada's Safety Code 6 guidelines, but Wireless installers and operators are obliged to comply with these standards that have been established by Health Canada. In this instance, you know, this, the, the maximum allowable would be far less than 1% of the actual limit. So it's very low powered uh, technology that we're using here. Uh, and it's ex extremely uh, lower than what's, what's allowed by Health Canada's Safety Code 6. The other concern that came up was uh, visibility of, of the uh, installation. I think uh, typical or compared to typical cell towers, and I'll show some images of this, uh, this proposal is very minor in nature. It's similar, it's similar in height to other utilities that are out there on the street now, other signage that's out there, light standards. It's in, in the realm of the height of those, those types of things out there. Um, <clears throat> And, and as far as location goes, typically we would locate installations like this uh, on commercial or industrial lands, as this is a commercial land. Um, and we've proposed to modify the design slightly, and I'll go through that in a bit, from what we originally proposed to the district uh, back in 2014. So these are sort of typical cell sites that you'd see. Um, there's, a, there's a monopole up here. The typical height of a cell site is probably 40 to 50 meters. We're only proposing 15 meters here, so it's substantially smaller uh, and much smaller in scale and closer to the scale of the village itself. Uh, the one over here is a self-support, which is uh, typically considered probably one of the more visible types of towers that you'd see and it's co most commonly found. You have a guide tower down here, and down here is a rooftop installation. Those are antennas on top of a rooftop. Get skip the one here. So this is our proposed installation, and I don't know if, if you've had a chance to go through your packages, but um, these are four uh, photo simulations of what the pole would look like within the village setting. Uh, the first one here is from the West Coast Natural Foods parking lot, about 150 meters away, and the pole is right there. 
So as you can see, it is fairly similar in stature to basically any above in, uh, ground infrastructure out there today. Uh, the diameter of the pole will be slightly bigger than the diameter of a uh, utility pole that's out there. The second one, this is probably a little large, larger than it should be, but um, that's taken from the rear of the CO itself, uh, just off Logan Lane. The third one down here is uh, from the Coast Capital Savings parking lot. And then the last one over here is um, from the Shop of Jugmart parking lot. It's located right in there. So that's sort of a, a, a look at what it would look like within the community from certain vantage points. Uh, we've done similar installations on Vancouver Island and in Vancouver itself. Uh, we did one at the CO in Courtney and the poles were located right there. That's a similar size pole that would be proposed uh, at the CO here. And we've done it in Ladysmith, it's right there. It's got a, there's a fir tree in the back, or sorry, a spruce tree in the background, but it's a little difficult to see, but it's right there. And then we've done a few of them in the Vancouver area. And that's it, right big, basically there. So similar height to utility poles that are out there. Uh, these are just designs of it. All of the, you know, a typical cell tower will have cables and lines running up it. Everything is internalized to this. So to minimize the visibility, you have all of the antennas included inside the pole. You don't see any external equipment, no external wires, nothing like that. It just appears as a pole. And that's about it. We're happy to take any questions you may have or any feedback you have, uh, maybe even talk about service in the area, that sort of stuff. And, and Doug's here to answer some questions as well. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, questions or comments from councillors? Councillor Pearson. Yes, thank you for your presentation. And I think that um, um, the major concern for all of us, aside from the health and safety, which I don't pretend to understand, is that we're spending an enormous amount of money in our downtown and the aesthetic um, uh, changing of downtown and making it look better. So I, I hope that this poll looks as unobtrusive as is there. So, and I'm hoping that TELUS can find its way to um, improve the front of their building somehow and, and work with our beautification committee as well. So that's, that would be a request for me as council, but, but thank you for your presentation. Okay. Other councillors? Councillor Casper? Uh, yes, when, when would the installation What's the proposed date or time? Uh, yeah, that's actually, that's why we're here this evening. Um, thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Um, we are here to ask you for concurrence for it, and I think there was a package sent in last week, um, and it should be in your reports, looking for um, endorsement of the installation, what we would call concurrence. Uh, that's what we require by Industry Canada, uh, to, move, to basically move ahead and start the installation of it. Uh, once we get concurrence, it'll have to feed into a, a budgeting program for TELUS. Um, I'd have to get back to, to you with the exact details of when they're going to start installation, unless Doug knows more than I do right now. Uh, just further to that, then, you know, I, I had to drag out my zoning map. So the property is uh, zoned uh, a public utility. Uh, it's regulated by the federal government, uh, your utility. You come under the... I can't remember what commission it is, but anyway. Um, and uh, really, you know, I, there, there's no way that we could even stop you from doing it because you're a federal, federally regulated agency and, um, and your zoning permits you to actually do what you propose to do. So I have no objection whatsoever based on that. If I can add a little bit to that, and I appreciate that. We yeah. do. We are regulated by Industry Canada. We follow uh, rules that they put in place. They are ultimately our regulator. They do have um, a guidelines in place for consultation of towers. And unless you have a policy explicitly saying, you know what, you can just go ahead and install whatever you want throughout a community, we do need to get specific approval for every installation from local government such as yourself. So if we weren't to get uh, an endorsement or a concurrence from you this evening, um, obviously we can work with you further, but uh, we would ultimately have to go to Industry Canada to get their buy-in on the project, which takes a great deal of time. So it's much easier and, and much better if we deal with you So folks. based on the information I've heard, I'm prepared to make a motion that, uh, that we endorse the, uh, uh, the, the 
proposed uh, cell phones uh, tower Can that I has been submitted tonight. So there's a motion moved um, by Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Parkinson. Any further discussion from councillors? Councillor Pearson? Here's the hammer. Um, so so I, I understand TELUS will work with our Arts and Beautification uh, Committee to, to make the front of that building look better in, in conjunction with our downtown uh, beautification program. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Peterson. Pearson. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm the general manager. Excellent. That's good. Great. So that Thank wasn't you. picked up by the webcast, but basically what has been said is that TELUS will be working with our newly formed suit program of the Arts Committee to look at a beautification project for the building and possibly the pole, depending on that outcome. So we look forward to that. And thank you for your time tonight. And I'll call the question on that. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much, okay. gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, our next order of business is D2, and we have a dele our second delegation is from the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce and President Sean Dybel. All right, good evening. Thank you. As the Mayor said, my name is Sean Dybel. I'm the President of the Souk Region Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate you giving me a few minutes tonight to provide you with our quarterly update. There we go. So I thought I would start tonight by giving you a quick uh, look at what our funding model looks like. And as you can see, we do have three main sources of revenue uh, with a total annual, annual revenue of about $78,000. I've rounded all these numbers off uh, just for simplicity's sake. Uh, the three main sources of our revenue are member dues. We have approximately 165 uh, members, and they provide a little less than a third of our annual revenue. We also have a fee-for-service agreement with the district, as you well know, and that accounts for approximately a, a little bit over a third. And then the final third is provided by member services and events that we have, such as uh, health care plans and other events, such as you know the golf tournament or our annual Business Excellence Awards Gala. So they're not quite uh, thirds, but they're fairly close. And while $78,000 is a, a significant sum of money, I'm sure you can appreciate that uh, we must spend it very frugally and wisely in order to achieve the goals that we would like to achieve. So I thought I would also provide you with an idea of, uh, you know, put our, put our revenue in context. What do we do with it? And to put it in a, an activity-based costing uh, format so that it makes a little more, uh, little more sense than saying we spend X number of dollars on rent, for example. I'll, I'll uh, give you an idea of, in percentages, I've included those in the right-hand side there of each line, percentage of our annual revenue that we spend on specific events. So as you can see, we hold very few member-only events, accounting for about 6% of our annual revenue. 34% of our annual revenue goes towards community events, and those are events that enrich the community, bring residents together, in fact thousands of residents together on an annual basis, uh, either to recognize excellence in our community, enjoy the outdoors, get to know our community better, or to celebrate a holiday in the case of the Santa, Santa Claus Parade, which is coming up at the end of November, November 29th at 5 p.m. actually. Our members consider it an, ex an important community service to give back to the community, and this is one of the main ways that we are able to do that. So as I said, we spend about a third of our annual revenue just on community events alone. And to carry on with, uh, so that's about 40% total that uh, I've accounted for so far. Another 48% or about $36,000 is spent on economic development. And there are quite a few different programs we run under the uh, broad heading of economic development. Those are some of them. A couple of them I'll get into a little bit more detail. Um, and, but I would point out, as, uh, as everyone is aware, of the $36,000, about $28,000 is provided as a result of the fee-for-service agreement with the district. District funds are not spent on any other activity other than economic development, as is appropriate given that agreement that we have. And the, the remainder is provided through, uh, you know, our membership. 
A couple of the things I would like to expand on a little bit, uh, the resident relocation project that we currently have, we recently had another 200 copies of our relocation, excuse me, of our relocation package printed, and I've brought copies for everyone if they'd like to take a look at it. Um, and we, we consider it one of the most important ways that we can in fact uh, help economic development in this community. Uh, not only does it um, bring wealth into the community as we have new people move into, into the area, but also it helps existing businesses flourish, and in fact it makes a very strong business case for new businesses to relocate into Souk. So there are many ways that it helps. I believe five out of the seven councillors and mayor were able to participate in our recent economic development symposium, so that is terrific. And although I could not personally attend, I was out of town at the time, I do believe that the symposium is one of, the, uh, one of our key initiatives this year that will carry on into next year um, that, that the Chamber is providing to the community on an economic development front. And I will get into that more in just a moment. Workforce development is another area that we've had some very good success with this year. Um, and it's actually a, an, edu an adult education initiative here in Souk um, that I will get into more again in, in just a moment. I also wanted to give you an idea of our people. So as we're in our 68th year of operation, we have about 165 members. We have 12 volunteer directors that have served on our board in the last year, and they are architects, independent business owners, consultants, hoteliers, university executives, and others. Each of them is working for Souk. Uh, on average, obviously not each, 100, 100 to 150 hours a month, but in total, uh, you know, up towards 150 hours per month of donated time, and they represent about 250 years of business experience between them. So significant wealth of knowledge to draw upon. We also have one full-time office manager. That is our only uh, full-time staff person at this time, and we are at a point where we do require a second uh, part-time assistant for that office manager, but financially, at least at the moment, that is not feasible. As I was saying earlier, uh, and I have a poster suitable for framing, but probably be, would be better off on the bulletin board, maybe down in the front lobby. It's an adult uh, continuing education initiative uh, called Learning on the Edge in Souk. Um, those five organizations have worked together over the past six to uh, nine months to put together a fairly broad uh, list of courses that are being run here in Souk. Um, they go from labor and employment law to can I eat this mushroom, a mycological adventure. I'm not even sure uh, what that would be about exactly. It sounds like eating in the wilderness, but uh, a very broad range of topics is what I'm trying to get across. This is a huge success for Souk, and what it basically means is that there will be seven, uh, several dozen courses run over the next six months as a pilot project. Um, that will allow adults interested in learning uh, various times during the week, nights, or on weekends, uh, without having to drive somewhere else in the CRD, but being able to do it right here in Souk. So it is a big success, and as I said, those organizations there are the ones that have uh, made it a reality. I alluded to it earlier, our economic development initiative. Uh, it's a five-stage project, the first step being completed at the end of September, as you know, uh, as most of you attended. But what it really will do is uh, have some tangible results as the project progresses for Souk. There were, the first stage was a symposium. It was six hours. It was held at the Souk Harbor House, and it involved many of the community leaders. About 40 people attended. And in essence, it was a brainstorming session with the goal of having an open and participatory session and identify issues or needs of the community that could be resolved within a 12-month time frame, but extending out even beyond that. Our board of directors is currently putting together an action plan that's based on the outcomes of that symposium. Early in the new year, January time frame, uh, we will have some public engagement. And for 2016, the plan will be to implement that action plan that is being developed currently and then follow up and check in with the other uh, organizations that are collaborating with us on this project. It is an ambitious plan, but it is something that we're excited to be working on over the next 12 months or so. So some of these will look familiar if you did attend the symposium, but these are some of the outcomes that were identified 
um, by attendees and participants. Some of them need to be refined. Uh, they're too general at the moment. They do need to be refined, but that is something that will happen as the action plan is being put together. I think the important takeaway for this moment is that we are working on an action plan, and it is based on the discussions and the outcomes from that meeting that, that many of you attended. I think one that I would like to specifically address is the last one, CAO hiring and the required skill sets. I did send each of you a letter last week um, outlining what we at the Chamber consider to be the required skill sets for this position. And, you know, certainly we have at the top of our list there uh, success, demonstrated success at economic development. As you can see, that's near and dear to my heart and to the Chamber's uh, stated goals. So I do urge you to read that letter if you haven't already and to please take it to heart. A tremendous amount can and will be achieved once the correct CAO is hired in the near term. So enough said on that. Some of the other ongoing activities that we are progressing, we have the Better Buy Soup program. Um, there are certain activities um, that we would like to dedicate more time to. Uh, and, and this is likely one of them that needs some more attention in the coming year. We've had some successes with it, but we would certainly like it to be higher profile. That being said, we did spend several thousand dollars over the past uh, several months since July on advertising in order to in encourage and make people aware of businesses still being open in the downtown during the construction. That's one example. Uh, I mentioned the resident relocation program already. We have over 70 members in our Newcomers Club, and those are uh, people that have moved to Souk within the last three years uh, that want to learn more about the community, and they're actually one of the best resources for uh, encouraging others to move to the community because they do know a lot of people that don't live here. They just moved here themselves. So we've had some success in attracting newcomers to the Newcomers Club, but also to Souk through that very venue. Business assistance, a good example of that. Uh, we do get several requests for assistance from either businesses that are already in Souk or businesses that might like to, re might like to locate in Souk uh, on an ongoing basis. Monthly, we have several. You know, it varies from month to month. Uh, but a good example lately would be, uh, you know, a composting uh, company that is interested in locating in Souk. Uh, and they're looking for some knowledge of what the uh, local conditions are, what properties are available, and uh, specific people that they should talk to. So that's a good example, I think, of uh, business assistance that we've provided in the last few weeks or month. Um, we're improving our chamber communications. It's something we're working very hard on. I write a business uh, article every month in the Business Examiner Victoria. It's a monthly newspaper. Uh, we have regular chamber chatter articles in uh, local pr media. Uh, we have over 1,000 followers on Twitter and 300 on Facebook as well. Uh, we've had the opportunity recently to... Uh, uh, do radio programs, etc. So uh, in the last few weeks, I've been on CFAX a few times. I guess they really had no programming, so they invited me on. But uh, I uh, discussed the election outcome this past Tuesday, and then previous to that, it was discussing Highway 14 and improvements that could be made to that highway. Mr. Dybel, just in the essence of time, we need you to wrap up your presentation. Certainly. I have Thank one you. slide remaining. So what are the next steps? I think there are many ways we could continue to develop our partnership. I, uh, I think we should meet, and I say we, I mean the Chamber and the District, either councillors or staff. Uh, we should meet in a less formal way and we should talk, or I should talk, more than once a quarter to you or with you. Um, I think there's a lot that we could accomplish. And um, I think if you recall uh, from the symposium, Ken Stratford had a fairly inspiring or quite inspiring keynote address and uh, his theme of that address was that it really is up to all of us, meaning the residents of Souk and the leaders in the community, to create the Souk that we want in the future. So I think we're only going to achieve that by working together and not by working uh, separately. So if I could extend the offer that once we have created our action plan that we uh, get together again and we go over the action plan together and see if we could, uh, you know, uh, we will take your advice on what you think the priorities should be for the action plan. Uh, and uh, I think if we could do that before the end of the year, we would have accomplished something. So thank you for your time, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I do think that the councillors that 
We're able to attend the symposium, look forward to receiving the report, and then of course as you develop your priority projects, it would be good to set up a meeting um, with myself and other councillors that are interested so we can talk about those. Council is also turning their minds to our next stages of our priorities for the coming term or for the coming year. And uh, so it'd be good to share those as well. So look forward to those opportunities. But any comments or questions from councillors? Councillor Ray then Pearson. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. And I was just wondering if you could make this PowerPoint uh, available to the, uh, the council. That'd be yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Pearson. Yes, thank you for your presentation tonight, Mr. Dival. And a um, couple of couple of keynotes in there is is the focus on the on on the membership piece at the very beginning, which I like, um, you know, and, and that communication part. And the second piece that I think I like most is is that there's going to be um, a Christmas parade on, at nighttime this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I sort because, of snuck that in. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that and no, that's good. And I and I think that those those are are more magical than uh, you know, so so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that's great. Okay, so we're going to move into our public question and comment period. So I'd like to invite any members of the public uh, who have any comments or questions regarding the items on tonight's agenda to please come forward to the microphone, state your name, address, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Is that something important? Gail Hall, 2517 Sook River Road. Um, I'd like to um, first look back to the public question and comment period from the last meeting where I commented on the um, toxic materials on uh, shipping containers. Uh, I don't think we need to worry because looking for something else I have found in the zoning bylaw under prohibitions that the use of shipping containers as dwelling units is prohibited in Souk. So um, that's in part three, 3.2 in your zoning bylaw. So that's one issue. Um, now we get back to this wondrous bike BC multi-use trail project and such. Um, I come back to the point where will we please stop calling that piece of property on Souk River Road a park? It is not a park and it will not be a park until you remove it from the land ALR from the, from the uh, ALR and declare it a park for Souk. And because it's not a park, it is zoned RU3, which is an agriculture zone, and that overrides the fact that it's in the ALR because the land commission will tell you that they do not object to the horseshoe pitch However, they also say at the bottom of the letter that this does not override local bylaws. So you have there a piece of property that is agriculturally zoned and under that zone, a horseshoe pitch is not an accepted use. So you've got to go back, you've got to take it out of the ALR and proceed in that way before you start talking about horseshoe pitches on that property. I think this is the fourth time I've said it, but I have reason tonight to want it on the record. The other one is whether we have a parking area on the non-agriculture land reserve area of Sook River Road Park. Again, it's not a park. This is RU2 Rural. And in order, that's the wonderful four on 10. Um, in order to put a parking lot there, which is only a parking lot, you're going to have to rezone again. So these are issues, and this business about the bike trail, um, your problem goes all the way back to the application that went in over a year ago. Um, it said at that time that, yes, the design was in, public consultation was in, and we were shelf ready to go. Here we are a year and a month later and you still don't know where you're going to put it. You still don't know what it's going to look like. You still don't know how much it's going to cost. And you will not come back to the public and ask them what they think. And um, it's a mess. And if they grant you an extension after you've promised in your agreement that you would have it done in a year, I will be surprised and shocked 
and angry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Next speakers. Ellen Lures, 5526 Sucrote. In case uh, you don't know, if you look at um, what uh, Gail was talking about, she's, it's very clear. It says this is a project shelf ready for the bike trail. Has a required property acquisition been completed? Have all required permits and approvals been obtained? It says yes. And it's clearly not so. So you, you need to look at that application. Um, <clears throat> Another uh, point I wanted to make is uh, when the chamber, uh, Mr. Dybal made his presentation there about the chamber, um, I noticed that there was the school uh, by, uh, or the college at Stickleback was not included in the list and that college was started under Wanda Fuca Community uh, Futures. I was a part of that one that, that was almost 20 years ago the school's been there and I was disappointed to see that they weren't included in the list of schools and educations, rather Royal Roads was included, and um, I'd like to know why. They've been in business here for 20 years. Uh, another issue I have is, is um, with the TELUS Tower. There's no public consultation. Council just moved and approved something without public consultation. Uh, when this issue came up several years ago, there were some councillors here that were on uh, that were here then, this room was full, packed full of people objecting to a tower going in our city centre. And I'm really disappointed that you moved and passed something without public consultation. Thank you. Okay, if you wish, um, Councillor Logans is just going to give some feedback on uh, the stickleback. I don't have an answer for that because this is a chamber initiative and not a council initiative. Mm -hmm. So why they weren't included, I can't answer that. Go ahead. Um, that was just, just to clarify, it was a partnership between those organizations, not excluding any, any specific businesses that are working towards providing education for the Souk region, just a few groups that are working together on a certain initiative. And just in regards to the TELUS Tower, the one that came forward a few years ago was an application by a new company for a new site, and it required um, approval by council. As this one, as Councillor Casper said, there's, their zoning is in place, and all those pieces are already in place. Mm -hmm. The other one was a brand new entity. It was wind something or other, and it was on a, a vacant parcel of land, and it required um, a resolution to go forward, which council didn't support at that time. In this case, this presentation has been ongoing for a while and public consultation has taken place as Telus said and they've initiated that. Other speakers? Um, can I get first time speakers? I just want to know what public was consulted. Well as he said there was all the residents within 100 meters of that site were notified. There was some 50 plus and then four people gave feedback to that particular site. Next uh, speakers? Hello, Mayor and Council. Mary Brooke from Souk Voice News. Um, I just wanted, even though I have a newspaper, which I presume a lot of people read, I would like it on the record that media was not welcome to the Chamber's Economic Symposium a few months ago, and it was uh, made an issue deliberately not to have media there. Um, I wrote to Mayor and Council about it. The only response I heard back that was in any way proactive was from Councillor Logans, who um, did it say at least that she would inquire with the chamber. Um, I find that the silence from mayor and council on media serving the community is quite appalling. Um, my newspaper has been publishing about Souk and in Souk for eight years and not always an easy job financially through the recession. Um, I did lodge a complaint with the BC chamber about the exclusion and I spoke to the Victoria chamber and they said that they welcome media at all their events including symposiums. The um, blocking media is not only to block the um, so-called service to the community that the chamber says that they're making. They, they're very proud of the fact they invited a wide swath of the community and 40 people attended. Well, for the other thousands of people who don't go, that's why we have media. And I really am quite perturbed that this town excludes media 
and we're not there to cause trouble for anybody, we're there to communicate for the public. And you're blocking free press. And the chamber is specifically. So um, I wanted this on the record. And um, as you know, my publication in particular reports on business and politics specifically and quite profusely. And to exclude having a business report on what's been called an, uh, quite an initiative by the chamber is is quite, uh, it's understand, un understandable, it's not understandable. I mean, so um, if there's something going on that the Chamber and the Council need to speak about with regard to media, I'd like to um, be part of that discussion. And uh, at the very least, they're blocking the ability for a business to do business in this town. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Brooke. Other speakers? Uh, Rick Hobday, uh, 6740 Road Night Drive. Um, I'm from the, uh, from the Souk Horseshoe Club, and I would like to know um, why we were uh, given an agreement to put horseshoe courts in, in that location without a knowledge of whether it was acceptable to the ALR or, or ALC. Um, and also, um, with the boundaries, uh, not notified uh, on on proper maps and stuff like that so um, right now the way the map is showing is that a part of our our piece of uh, property that that you've been we've been uh, given uh, to for use is um, in not in LAR ALR land it's in the, the other private section so I just wanted the question is, is that if um, if we go forward on this will we be able to b build on that section because we've already started construction in that area and now we've had that uh, work uh, stop work order put on it and we just want to know why um, or if we're going to be able to continue on in that area okay we'll get to that yeah. when we hit that portion in the materials other speakers Okay, so we'll move into our regular agenda, starting with reports for information, RI1, the town center update. And you'll see in the yellow pages on page 13 is um, our report from staff. And so just a question or some things to clarify, um, just with Mr. Dillabaugh, I believe you'll be leading off on this report. Um, it's just my understanding is that we are roughly 10% over our initial budget, plus the works that we've added on, but there will be no impact on 2015 taxes and the project will be fully funded this year. And so, Next year we'll be setting new priorities and new projects and this project is not carrying into, it's not a part of next year's budget. It'll all be fully funded this year. Um, what I would also like to know is just what our timeline is for completion. Um, we do have the parade and the light up happening on the 29th, so ideally we want traffic safely moving through the town core and the lighting that we've ordered on uh, to be ordered and installed and then there were some discussions early on where council had asked for up to 11 I believe ornamental light fixtures to be installed and there's two charts here or a new part of me two maps the larger one is sort of showing where current lights are sitting the proposed lighting but there is still a desire to have those other lights put in. So I'm just wondering if that can happen. So I'll leave that with you and turn it over to you, Mr. Dillaball. Thank you, Your Worship. So this is, a, as you mentioned, a, an update on the town center project that I think we all are very proud of and the progression and, and really excited about what's going on in the town center. Uh, to confirm, yes, in fact, that this uh, the impact of the the budget will not impact the 2015 taxes and the entire project, provided that the recommendation is moved and and uh, carried by council this evening for the funding 
will not carry forward into future years. So it'll be entirely funded this year. So there will be no impact going forward from this project. Uh, I'll touch a, a little bit as well, uh, just on the, the funding uh, and the, the pr proposal. Uh, as council was updated previously, we did not and were not successful in, the, in getting the grant for the phase two of the grant road connector. So the recommendation this evening is to remove that from the financial plan and use the funding from the GST and the casino and the small portion that was allocated from taxes to that project and move that to the town center project and the remainder to come from the gas tax reserve. And that's outlined in your, your materials this evening. The, um, beyond that and, and about the street lights, I'd, I'll pass that over to Ms. Nelson to, to touch on that. And if there are any other questions from council, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the funding piece at the moment? Oh, Councillor Ray. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a couple of um, items. Uh, in the report, it talks about that there was uh, some items that were redundant um, and have been removed from the contract. But I don't see any of that offsetting in the budget numbers. So I was just wondering, uh, was it very much or was there no impact uh, financially for taking stuff off? And just if you could um, refresh my memory why we didn't have a contingency um, element to that budget. Uh, through you, Worship. The 14,000, if you look under tendered project, the additional and reduction, that's the net result of the of additions. It's on page 14 on the chart on page 14. The, the number is 14,000. Okay. So that net line result. is okay. the net result of the additions and the subtractions. Okay. So that's where that is the, the net result. Uh, touching on the, the, that there was no contingency in initially uh, inputted into it, to be honest, it was an oversight. Okay. And so it's a, a learning experience for us and fortunately it's within a 10% amount. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Dillabaugh. Other questions on the fund, Councillor Casper? Uh, just a clarification. So so when when we look at the um, unforeseens that occurred, which increased the cost. Um, it's my understanding that a lot of those dealt with some drainage issues uh, because of um, the drainage that uh, links in with the, with the highway drainage system from our other roads that the municipality owns and, and the changes that occurred in order to accommodate those drainages, correct? Through you, Your Worship. From a technical perspective, I can pass it on to Ms. Nelson, but a, a large portion of that additional was due to what was found underground that wasn't expected. And so there were additional quantities required in terms of fill and excavation. So that is a, a large portion of the additional. Right, and, and, and I think it's important to sort of go, you know, note and go back in history that when we were unorganized territory administered by the Ministry of Transportation and Highways for all subdivision and ultimately development approvals with the CRD. Um, a lot of those works and services were accommodated by the Ministry of Transportation and Highways. So we got 40, 50 years of history underground and really nobody knew what the heck was under there. And, you know, you know and, and I can attest to that because it, it's been an ongoing problem over the years. People assume there were pipes under there, and there were pipes there, but they didn't go anywhere. They didn't hook up to anything, and I think they found a lot of surprises. And, you know, I can appreciate and understand why these things occurred, because really there is no point in putting all this work if you've got poor subsoils below the road surface, because it, it will just compound more problems in the future. So. You know, they've done a heck of a lot. And uh, when you look at it, the fact that the town was still running, traffic still moving, and all that construction occurred, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big project for any, any, any community, especially our side. So I just thought I should add that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Casper. Councillor Berger? 
Yes, thank you. Uh, Councillor Casper and Councillor Ray asked two of the questions that I had, but the other one um, was for myself as well as the rest of the public. When we're looking at the um, changes to work and um, the amount of dollars attached to it, further to what Mr. Dillbaugh said, if we could get just a quick synopsis of what, like what the unforeseen works were, um, the, the where it says replacement of unsuitable base materials, is that were we thinking of using the base materials that were there, but it was old and needed to be redone? Just a quick synopsis of what the changes were. Through you, Anna Mayor, I'll, I'll do my best on the quick synopsis. Um, with the additional widening of the road to accommodate for the bike lanes, there was a, a lot of trees and stumps and that, that type of thing found. There was a lot of pipes that, as, as Councillor Casper said, that either led to nowhere or were in different locations that we weren't anticipating, so they had to be relocated or capped or that kind of thing. There was, um, for example, things like the, the relocation of the mailboxes that were on Brownsey Boulevard. Those, I mean, some of those are minor things, but um, for the, actually going back to the removal of the, the um, unsuitable materials and the widening of the road, that of course results in more import coming back in as well. There was um, rock hammering for catch basins, um, there was a couple of uh, calls out for hydro vacuum because we found a couple of sinkholes, so we had to find out what the problems were. So that, again, in order to make sure that we had a suitable base at the end of the day. Um, there was some additional trench and backfill due to the storm main not being in the location that we anticipated due to all the changes over, the, over time. Things sort of underground snaked in different directions than we had anticipated. Um, we did add some drainage works on the south side of the highway to um, alleviate some drainage issues that um, the, south, the properties on the south side had spoken about. Um, let's see. We uh, upgraded the Chevron access to make sure that the, when we moved the sidewalk closer that the, the steep slope was flattened a little bit more. Some of those things you can't really see during the design stages until you actually start digging, then you see the impacts of, of the things you're doing. Mm, that's, I mean, there's, I can go on, but that's sort of the, does that work? Does that answer your question, Council Berger? Yes, thank you. Just when you're reading the headlines, it's, I'm sure people in the public too wanted to know what what's mm -hmm. involved in that, right? Like unforeseen costs, I'm, sh I'm sure we all know there's, probably tons such as pipes and stuff but it's just good for when we're seeing these large dollar amounts for myself I'd like to know sort of what's in there so thank you good other questions on the funding okay so now perhaps if I could get some input from Miss Nelson just in terms of um, sort of what our timelines are and just also what we can do about the ornamental lighting the lighting um, the ornamental lighting was left with the addition, I believe, there was up to 12 additional lights. And the, the way I looked at it was lights, not necessarily light standards, because as we were going on site and with construction proceeding, the areas where we could put conduit in and install a, a light became quite um, constrained, if you will. So I, add, I added the, the dual lights and the medians, which I figured were two lights and two banner arms, so that would solve that. And um, there's room there. I, um, I didn't show lights on the south side in front uh, east of where the RBC bank is proposed because there's quite a great difference between the back of the sidewalk and the property line is right there. So it becomes really difficult to actually install the lights with that great difference. And, and as I said, we didn't want to stop construction to start installing some of the conduits, so we had to work around where we are, were able to still get the conduit in, which I roughly showed on this sketch. It's really kind of hard to see on there, but that's, um, so I have the, so right now we have 11 lights, if you will, with 11 banner arms. So just to clarify, so we have 11 new lights? Eleven of the ornamental decorative town center lights that are in our bylaw. Okay, and then. Okay, so I'm just um, because some of them are double armed. Yeah, I see. Eleven lights. That's Eleven right. lights, but some are. But seven standard. Well, seven standards in total. Seven standards with eleven lights. Right. And then eleven banner arms. Yes. Okay. 
well, no, sorry, or 11 banner arms with electricity on the ornamental lights, and then all the lights that you see on, on the sketch, I don't know if it's easy to see, the blue lights that are the proposed Cobra street lights all have banner arms, they just don't have the electrical plug-in. And those are the ones that, those are the blue ones, the Cobra arms are the ones that the ministry is putting in to light up those particular areas. But those aren't ornamental, but they can accommodate the banner. And then the ornamental ones are ornamental with lights and banners. Right, and, and but all of, them, all of them are colored black according to match with our bylaw To match the town center. Okay, okay. Questions from councillors on the lighting? Um, I guess if I may then, in terms of the seasonal lights that we've ordered, those go on the ornamental lights, both the uh, ones that are singles and the ones that are doubles. Correct. Okay, so I think we've ordered 12. And so we'll have one, one to spare, one spare then. Okay, do we have a sense of um, when I guess that leads into the next question. When will this all be finished? Well, that's, <laughs> that's the panic. So we're, we're working on detailed design at the moment so that we can go out for final costing because the costing on the previous 10 light standards actually came in, as you notice, in, on sheet 14 at 130000 That was sort of a, a rough estimate we got from the current on-site electrical contractor. So if... If we continue to work sort of in between that 60 and 130, then we can just carry on with this existing contractor. If that's not acceptable, then we will have to chunk it into pieces and try and tender out and see if we can get it cheaper. Okay, but I think um, to, Ms. to Mr. Dillabaugh that um, part of capturing that would be in the recommendation that's outlined uh, that you'd be looking for council direction on to support or not, and then provided it does, then that gives staff the ability to carry on and just complete this work. That's right, yeah. That's okay. the intent of the, the recommendation as it stands. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's an update on the paving schedule as to when that may be. I know that there's weather played yeah. the factor, but I've, my understanding is that we're into sort of a good dry time right now. So if there's any sort of news on what the paving's going to look like and when that might be finished. Through you, Your Worship, the most up-to-date uh, schedule that we have is likely late next week or early the following week for everything to be done from a paving perspective. So that's kind of the schedule that we have. If we think sort of the week following next week, then everything should be completed by, by that time, which I guess is the week of Remembrance Day. Exactly. There's a, the parade leaves the, the evergreen. So, okay. Um, well, the, but the, the parade's at the end of November, though, right? Well, I know the Remembrance oh, the, Day Parade oh, okay. right. um, leaves the Evergreen Mall on the 11th, which would be, you know, Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah, so just about two weeks, I guess. Okay. So that, that's the most up-to-date schedule that we have. I mean, we can certainly express that to the contractor. As I say, what, the, what we have is that it should be the end of next week. But again, given weather and, and that sort of thing, that's where I say well, perhaps into early the, the following week. But hopefully okay. it is weather permitted by the end of next week. Yeah, it would be good for them just to push on. And then in terms of the, just before I go to you, Councillor Casper, um, the seasonal lights, um, those have been ordered. Do we know when they might arrive? I know that they're... Your Worship, I haven't any indication when they were going to arrive, but I can find out for you. Okay. We've been assured that they'd be here in time for installation, so... Okay, great, so that they're here for the... For the that can wait for the Santa Parade. <laughs> but, yeah, not... Okay. Councillor Casper? Yeah, uh, so my question then re relates to the, orna or the ornamental lighting component. When will that lighting be done? Is it going to be done before the end of November? I do not have the answer to that at this point, but I will get that. So I, I just, you know, I cannot help but stress that I think that's what we wanted. We wanted it done by the end of November. 
so in time for the Christmas parade and all those other festive things. Um, the other thing is that there's been no night, night work. Uh, in the contract, the highways assured us that uh, if need be, they would work at night. Uh, all that paving done on Highway 14 was done at night. So is it not possible to talk to them? Because they had factored in doing night work on this project. They told us that. So that why, why can't that be done as far as the asphalt and, and doing it when there's less traffic and disruption uh, in the community? And, and if there's a weather situation, why can't that be done? Um, I, I was told verbally a week ago that uh, uh, that they didn't plan on doing that, but I but I looked at the fact that we had been given a schedule, and it doesn't look like the schedule that we had received is actually happening, and that's as far as the paving is concerned. It's it's gone back a week, been put back a week. Um, I don't I don't know if weather was a factor or not, but I know on that Remembrance Day, no, on the Thanksgiving Day weekend. We had some reasonably dry weather and there wasn't anybody working from Friday to Tuesday on that job site. Four days, just sort of gone, nobody there. And to me that would just, you know, I, I appreciate people taking time off, especially if it's gonna be a long weekend, but it, it just seemed like a poor utilization of the days and the hours for the project. The project started late through no fault of our own. It was not our fault that the project started late. And, um, and, and so I, I, I'm hoping that, that those things are done because I don't wanna see us you know, saying, oh, well, it's gonna be late again when the original pro uh, project timelines were the end of October. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we council fully supported the night work to happen and just with the essence of time now, shorter days, uh, weather being a factor, they did do the night work on the other section of Highway 14. It's the same contractor, so that's why, you know, I think they need to move, it, we need to move ahead on this right now. And the ministry was the one that wanted to actually have their opening today, <laughs> which they have since um, not rescheduled. So it is their timelines, it's not us that's holding it up, but we're the one answering the questions. So I think everything to push them along at this point is, is very important. They need to button this one up. We'll certainly communicate that with, with them as well as the timeline for the end of November for the lights as well and factor that into our, our work. So. Yeah, because what I also think is happening like in terms of the timelines and the completion date is that uh, through speaking with other councillors, there was a desire to have um, you know, the Christmas parade occur, for it to happen at night, and then our town would light up, the, the annual light up would tie into the parade, and that way we're sort of creating a seasonal event as opposed to a parade happening one day and light up another day, and, and uh, so there's been a lot of volunteers. Um, Councillor Parkinson's been working to pull people together. We want the tree and the roundabout, like all those things to sort of happen to really kick off the season, and I know there's a, a sense of pressure, but you know, there's still time, so we just look forward to having that that done. Okay, any further questions on funding, timelines, construction, lighting? Okay, so there is a recommendation here, and that is that council direct staff to remove the phase two grant road connector from the financial plan in 2015 and 2016, and that the funding from the GST and casino reserve funds and taxes that were allocated to this project be reallocated to the town center construction project and further that council authorize the additional funding for the town center construction project to be funded through gas tax reserves. Moved, Moved and by Councillor Parkinson, seconded by Councillor Logans. Any discussion or clarity needed on the motion? Okay, all those in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Thank you, we look forward to seeing this done and thank you very much for all the work so far. Okay, our next item is RI2. It's the Souk Fire Rescue Service's third quarter report. And there is a staff report here, and that's 
for the motion to receive it for information, and that starts on page 23. Our fire chief is here tonight. If there's any questions, thank you, Fire Chief Sorensen. Any comments or questions from councillors? Motion to receive the report with thanks from Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Parkinson. Um, there's one question that I have. You may see in the materials, um, Fire Chief, there's a number of written letters regarding the BC Ambulance response times. And they seem to be coming through both to us as well as other, a few other West Shore municipalities. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you have any comments about this at all, or I know it's the ongoing lack of ambulance services um, and that often the, the volunteers are responding as first responders, but just wondering if you may have any comments to add to this. Well, without getting into specifics of what's going on, I guess, um, I, I did a quick uh, look at our stats for uh, first responder calls and ambulance delays for, for 2015. And as of today, there's been 54 um, response, 54 of the first responder calls we've attended, which we've waited 10 minutes or more for an ambulance, um, the longest being 50 minutes. Um, so it, it seems to be increasing and it seems to be increasing more as the year goes on. So, um, you know, I can't speak if there's enough ambulances on the road, but uh, it, it does seem to be a problem that is affecting Souk and that we're waiting more and more for an ambulance and that they're not always available in, in the community. And that would explain why the one took the 50 minutes is that it would have come from another area and out. It's not sitting at either in Souk or sitting at um, Connie Road. Yeah, the, yeah they've changed the way they, they allocate ambulances in, in this region. Okay. Thank you. Not to didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but just with the other information. Other, any other questions, comments? Thank you very much, Fire Chief. All those in favor of receiving the port, opposed, motion's carried. Our next is RA3 and Mayor and Council reports for verbal updates. Well, I guess you did, so it's my turn because I wasn't here. Thank you, Councillor Parkinson, for covering off that last meeting. And I also would like to thank all of Council for providing the recommendations uh, to support my coming leave. Um, we'll see how that goes. And also, you have your acting mayor and Council committee appointments, so look forward to just seeing business roll on. Um, a few things just to share. As you know, Safe Halloween is occurring this Saturday here at the Municipal Hall. Um, the fireworks that were not used on Canada Day will be, will be set off by our, our volunteer fire department. Um, the Sioux Harbor players are also going to be in costume and sort of involved in this event. And anyone who would like to come down and put on a costume for the kids, you're more than welcome to do that. So please feel free to join in. Um, a reminder to Council that the Legion Parade is on November 11th. And so we received a letter and I just would like to confirm if anyone is interested in, in doing the march. Um, I intend to. And uh, we'll and then carry on with the festivities at the Legion, so I'll let them know. Um, there is an economic summit being held in, I believe the locations change, it's in this, I think it's at Interurban Campus now on November the 7th, it's a Saturday. This came about through ongoing monthly meetings or sort of quarterly meetings that the mayors of the CRD have together. There was a desire by some to have the CRD take on the role of economic development for the region, um, but just given what the CRD's sort of purpose is and what they need to focus on, economic development was not made a priority. So the other mayors have said, okay, well, we need to look at still doing something. So 
There's an invitation that goes out to all of councillors to attend. It's being facilitated by the Greater Victoria Economic Development Agency, uh, various chambers and so forth. So I'm, I have it scheduled to look at going. It's just for the morning and just to see where that goes. A lot of it came about through uh, also being at conferences and in terms of what the region as a whole is funding in terms of economic development, how fragmented it is and just how we're not seeing the job creation occur in this area that could occur if there's a more coordinated approach. So that's what that's all about. Um, C Park will be advertising, or that initiative um, through our district actually is advertising for two public appointments to the C Park Commission. So I believe that's gone out, and that will be to look at um, our two souk public representatives for that commission. At the CRD level, there's been a lot of discussion about water and the coming regional sustainability strategy. And there's been a lot of back and forth on water flowing out into areas of Souk, even that do not have water, or the adjacent one to Fuca lands that do not have water. Um, it's been, I don't know how many hours of discussion that have occurred. Um, Councillor Casper has attended some of the workshops. I've been at some of the workshops. Our, municip our current OCP has water going to all areas within our community. Um, there's some within the CRD that say that they don't want water to go out to other areas because there's a concern of urban sprawl occurring. Uh, we do have our OCP and our zoning bylaws that guide us. Um, so it's, it's been interesting dialogues in terms of the regional sustainability strategy itself. It's kind of gone back to staff again because we have the regional growth strategy in place, um, but the last report didn't show what it changed or added. It wasn't so it's still a work in progress, but at the end of the day, all municipalities need to sign off on this. I believe it was in May when Director Hicks spoke to Council, just sharing some of his concerns, um, some of the argument that sprawl would occur in these are in certain areas just seems to be more of a myth because some of the OCPs that have been adopted actually are decreasing the amount of residents, not increasing them in the other way. So it's been an interesting exchange. CRD Parks Commission or Carts Committee is going to be releasing its annual report on all of the regional parks in the area. Some of it outlines a plan that they have to finally open sections of Harborview, um, which likely development of or the first pieces of will occur in 2016 with an opening more in 2017. It's only for one section. It's basically the area that goes to Mount Quimper and back, so we're gonna see more information of that come around. Um, as you know, or you may recall, um, the primary health working services group that was formed under Mayor Milne is a committee that I continue to chair. Um, there has been an extensive report and analysis done on x-ray facilities. A lot of you probably received Concerns, complaints, like what is going on with our x-ray facility in Souk. It's analog, it's outdated, it's open two hours a day, twice a week. Um, not providing any service to the community. There I am still waiting for the public report to come and be released. Our main challenge is licensing, whereby we cannot get another license for this area because whoever issues the licenses feels that St. Anthony's and Vic General are adequate to service everybody and they will not grant another license. So we've talked about what if we buy the x-ray? What if you fundraise and get the x-ray equipment? What if you actually have a building to house it? What if you do all these things? You cannot get the license. That is the whole challenge is getting the license for this area. And so it's the case of the decision makers realizing that it's a disservice. It's a disservice for anyone living here who then has to go there and wait it doesn't work for our doctors. Um, they lose the ability to provide adequate service. So it's an ongoing push. I've raised it with John Horgan, so he's aware of it. And it's just an ongoing battle, but it's just getting another license. We can do everything else, but if we don't have the license, we can't make it happen. Councillor Ray. Uh, yes, so is that VHA who controls that licensing process, or is it provincial government? No, it's actually the radiologists themselves. It's like a private entity within a public system. 
and that's what's you know it's like is it because is, is it island health like who is it it's the it's the rate and they are their own entity that then approve and monitor this i can't remember their exact name but that's what it is yeah so it's ongoing work um the committee itself is going to be looking at having a public health summit likely in march um, this is following up on programs like the GP for Me Day, all the different health surveys that have gone out, and it's sort of the report back to the community. So there's been a lot of work done, but there it's been, and the various information that's been gathered, and so it'll be time to timely to give the feedback back to the public. Um, there has been various priorities established, so it's going with that, okay, where do we go with this piece now? What have been the successes and the achievements since the GP for Me Day? There has been two GPs brought into SUC and so forth. So it's just continuing to roll on and so look forward to having that. There'll be a meeting hopefully with stakeholders, whether it's the same time or a different time, uh, but the public <coughs> summit will occur. So we're looking at booking that. And then lastly, I had a meeting with the, I lost my notes. The ben it's the Victoria Benevolent Society, and this is where we often talk about um, just housing for homeless in our <coughs> community. Um, at the moment, we do have the extreme weather uh, protocol that's activated. Um, it only is activated under certain situations, though, so freezing temperatures, rain, snow, and it's temporary, it's drop-in. Um, last year, there were maybe two to three persons on average using the shelter when it was activated. It could be because it's new or maybe that's just um, the outreach that was done. Who knows? Um, but they are interested. They do have land available to potentially look at providing a more um, substantial uh, overnight shelter, say, of various forms available in Souk. They're now doing their work into finding what that actual need might be. And so that might come up um, sometime, perhaps when I'm on leave, depending on how much fact-finding they do. But we often hear about residents living in rough conditions here. Um, if I may use the term, maybe under a slumlord landlord, it's sketchy situations, but where do these folks go if those facilities don't exist? This may be an alternative where people can be stabilized. And also, it's built in with support from both counseling food, all of that, so that may actually um, give somebody a more stable way of being until they can move into a more long-term facility. So something that's in the works anyway. So that's basically about it. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. And other than that, we'll just see, does anyone else have anything that they would like to share or add at this time? Yes, microphone. Uh, suggestion that uh, you know in regard to the x-ray uh, facility that is or is not operating in souk um, maybe maybe another approach is to contact the Medi medical services commission the people who are in charge of i don't know if that's the proper name the people who issue the billing licenses uh, to the medical services plan and and maybe uh, inquire to them to have that authorization being reconsidered because if if it's not being fulfilled to its fullest extent in our community and it was in my uh, assumption issued on the basis that it was to be operated in souk to serve the people in this community and now if it's not being utilized to its fullest extent then perhaps that billing license or that authorization should be withdrawn and that may, may force the issue, push come to shove, if they want the billing license and the authority to, to, uh, to practice to some degree in Souk or anywhere else. Because that, that number, that license is, is still exists as far as I'm, I've been advised. So maybe that's the tack that should be taken. The challenge there is that the folks that have the one in Souk also have St. Anthony's. Mm -hmm. And that's where they feel that St. Anthony's is adequate for Souk. And it's, all, it's not that far, it's one community over, and that's the challenge that we have. It's not 
it doesn't work for our residents here and it's a disservice and but they view it whoever it is is making this decision is just look like well it's right here you know you have enough licenses to service this area they've clearly never driven out here this time of year I just imagine folks at Air Manor, somebody falls, they're suffering from whatever, they have to be bundled up, driven, wait, hours. It's just an unacceptable situation. And that's the problem. You know, I, I would support full, full authority of authorization for you to go political on the issue, to rattle a few cages. You know, I think maybe we should even look at, okay, what is the standard that, that our local vets accommodate for pets exactly and 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 is that of a higher standard than what everybody else is getting in souk because if that's the case you know and i think you have to document and build a case and an argument in this community and you know I, rattle the cages that's what has to be done and if push comes to shove if if, if this whole thing is all about money and not wanting to invest in a facility that was in place here before and not bring up to the standards, then we have to make that the issue. And maybe we should start making some phone calls. I'm a pet owner, I'm gonna phone my vet and find out what are the facilities of x-ray for pets in this community? What are the diagnostic tools available for pets? And you know, I've heard some rumors, but I'm not gonna say them, but I'm gonna actually do some confirmation to find out. Our pets be, have better uh, diagnosis treatment than the people who live in Souk? They probably do. Well, you know, <laughs> and, just, I'm and, going off and, of my own. A, and that's a sad comment it is. in our society. And I think that's the kind of message, like really, you have to really, you know, you have to fight this with fire. You have to be hard-nosed, you take no prisoners, and you lay it out in such a way where Push comes to shove. If you're not going to fully utilize the billing license that's been authorized for x-ray and diagnostic services, then you shouldn't have the billing license or that authorization. Nor should you be allowed to transfer that license into another community to upgrade their facilities or somebody else's. Yep. While we get the sort of end bums rush on the, on the very end of the road in, in, in the capital region. And to me, that's wrong, you know? And yeah. I think the harder we fight, the more you get a vocal on it, the better off our citizens will be. It's not my place to do it. I hope you would do it. No, it's fully my intention. Good. And what I'm waiting for is I want- you got my encouragement. I want that report to come to yeah. council so Why you can certainly see the work that's been done, the research, the business case is there. Yeah. So in terms of, the volume, the patient volume, why, like who's sending and why, and all those reasons. The research is, it's astounding. So it's just, it's, it's extremely frustrating. And then the existing facility is just not, it's not, it's, it's analog dated technology that doctors can't even read. It's not acceptable. So it's extremely frustrating. And then just to say, okay, go to Vic General or go wherever, it just doesn't work. So just waiting for that because I do want that to come before council so you can see the whole scope of work and then really roll forward on it. Councillor Ray. Uh, yes, thank you. And I, and I would just like to um, say outside of, I couldn't imagine being a parent with a small child that's got a broken arm, but also the economic factors that occur by parents or people having to take time off of work and to leave our community or be in Victoria and come back. So I think it's uh, healthcare first and foremost. Yep. But I think it's also taxing uh, on uh, family incomes at a time when uh, things are tight. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's all those reasons. So thank you very much. Councillor Parkinson. <laughs> Your Worship, can you please announce those members appointed to the Souk Program for the Arts? Or may I do it? It's on the, I believe that's part of our new business. Uh, it's on the agenda, NB3. So yeah, we will do that. Okay. Which we're, we're coming up to after the CEO report. It's on the yellow sheet. Yeah, I yeah. oh I didn't look at that. Okay. Okay, so um, any other items then? We'll move into RA4, the CEO report. Mr. Dillabaugh, acting CEO report. 
Thank you, Your Worship. I don't have anything to report at this time. <laughs> if there's any questions from council, I'd be happy to take them. Any questions to our acting CEO? No? Okay. So we'll move into our new business portion here, uh, which is on our yellow sheets here. So we removed UB1, RRI1 was the town centre, so that brings us to C1, which is after this. So NB1, new business report for information. It's the 2015 quarter three variance report, which is on page 27. And any questions or comments to Mr. Dillabaugh or Mr. Dillabaugh, do you have anything to report back to us on? Uh, I'll just touch on quickly, uh, overall uh, things were well within budget, a few areas over, a few areas under, but uh, g in general, uh, well within budget and we'll continue to monitor expenses and revenues throughout the, the end of the year as we always do. So. If there are any questions from council, I'd be happy to take them at this time. Councillor Ray then Berger. Uh, yes, thank you. Just a quick one on page 38 um, under the street lighting and traffic control, the crossing guards, do we just pay a, an annual contract up front? Yes, we do. Okay, yeah. thank you. Councillor Berger. Thank you. I just have to find my page. Sorry, bear with me. Um, Should I go back to Councillor Ray while you're looking? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, it's tucked away up here. Uh, on page 33, I, I do hate to open this question up, but um, the boat launch expenses, um, just if you could uh, let us know what why we're over the <coughs> 770. Sorry. Uh, through you, Your Worship. There's, there's a couple of factors to that. The, the one is that the budget probably needs to be adjusted going oh, forward. So this is really the first year that we've had those expenditures. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, in the revenue section, the revenues are there to offset those expenses. So yes, we're over budget, but, but it's on both sides. So the impact on the, the overall organization isn't the 4,000 over budget on the expenses. And just as, uh, because I can't help myself, I just would like to confirm that uh, it, it's nice to see that our legal costs are uh, for the year to date are not even $33,000. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good sign. Yes, it is. Just as a comment. <laughs> Councillor Berger. Okay. Thank you. Um, so one of my questions was the boat launch expenses as well. Was there works that were needed to be done or was it? Just general operating expenses, or uh, through you, your worship, those expenses are are primarily just the operating expenses. Operating? Uh, there was in a, elsewhere in the budget uh, an area where we, there was some work that that was determined that needed to be done. We haven't yet got to getting the work done, but it is in a separate area of the budget that we will pro be pro pro proceeding with whether it's at the end of this year or now because of timing and everything, it might actually carry over into next year. Okay, thank you. And then my next question is, it's on a positive note, but I'm curious. On page 44, it shows miscellaneous revenue and we're up 379% or something. Oh no, more than that. It was miscellaneous revenue we had projected at a thousand and we're at 400,000. So just wondering what that is. Hmm. Uh, through you, your worship. Just because it's kind of cool to say, it's actually up 37,996%. Uh, in, all ser in all seriousness, actually, 400,000 of that is the payment from Sun River uh, through the agreement. So that's actually what that's for. And so it, unfortunately, it's not as, as great news as, as maybe it looks. <laughs> Uh, as that money will be uh, transferred into a reserve. But again, it's a positive for sure. <laughs> Councillor Logans, then Casper. Um, first off, this is really, it, it, for a newbie like me, it makes things make sense. I'm like, oh, I see where we spent this and that. And so 
thank you for putting that together. Um, but on page 39, under economic development and conference hosting, where we've spent no money, um, I just wanted to, to remind everyone that that's something we can think about when we meet with the chamber in the future. Thank you, Councillor Casper. Yes, on page, 40, on page 47, um, item seven, so what happens with the revenue offset? Does that go into our, our general revenue fund? Where does that go? Uh, training th costs, right? Yeah, through you, Your Worship. The revenue goes into general revenue. The expense is also in the general fund as well. So they, from an accounting perspective, we have to show them separately, but they really do offset each other at the end of the day. Right, right. So, so um, the way, way it's been explained to me is that every time we host these things, we actually make a profit because we charge organizations for coming and doing stuff so they they pay a fee we go through all the hosting we absorb the cost of hosting these events and then we actually turn a profit so I, I just hope that the money that we turn a profit goes back in the general revenue fund and it, it isn't spent elsewhere is that the case uh, through you worship you're right you're right in the the cases where we do offer it externally this specific training was actually for our staff mm -hmm. and we got a grant to pay for that training so okay. the expense is there because we had to pay the justice institute in order to get the training yes and we got a grant to pay for that that comes okay. in on the revenue side so, so but on my other was that when we host events for training purposes if they make money then yes that okay, difference so that would in there. yeah and and is it possible in the future um, when you list all these items that if there is a dollar figure applicable to what it is could could you put um, behind the you know the words what the dollar amount is so that we don't necessarily have to go searching it, that would help me because you know I'm I'm going from page to page to page, and and I know this is the overall uh, variance report, right? That indicates a line item, correct, or the items. If you'd prefer, I can certainly do that. The, the intent of that was is more that like the variance report is actually the detail yeah. of all of the accounts, and that's just the explanation of some of the items that are kind Hi. of. High and low. Right? High or low, yeah. yeah. Well, Did it would help if I had the numbers. Okay. Because I'm busy searching where they are. Yeah, so. nope, sounds good. Thank you very much. Good. Councillor Parkinson, did you have a question? Oops, sorry, no. Okay. Any other questions or comments from councils or councillors? Okay, if I could have a motion to receive the report. So moved. Moved by Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Logan. All those in favour? Opposed? Motions carried. Thank you. Okay, so our next NB2 is the Souk River Road Lands and Bike BC Cycling Infrastructure Grants. I've asked that this report come forward because my last understanding is that we still don't have any feedback from the ALC in regards to our request to put a trail through that the one parcel of land and so now we're just sort of stuck um, when the grant first went out there was sort of a, a section identified going up alongside the road on municipal right away um, crossing over to Kirby through onto the goose um, we had sort of the horseshoe pitch and their agreement in place um, and work starting in that area which we've since stopped um, we looked at shifting into a different area and then there was a discussion on parking for uh, the adjacent recreational fields or for the interests of the public and the like. So um, both Councillor Pearson and Councillor Ray spent some time over the summer on a few occasions as part of a task force to examine this area and, and to share their findings. And so now 
that we're reaching the end of October and we have um, folks waiting, you know, Horseshoe Club waiting as to what is our direction on this. Um, other processes, we have a grant. It's kind of time like, what are we going to do with this area? So that's where there's the different pieces here. And sort of on page two um, is sort of laying out um, some different options for council to look at considering um, in terms of A, B, and C, or other. But it's just, yeah, Councillor Ray. Thank you. Uh, this is a question before we get into the discussion. Uh, I w was noting in the Parks and Trails uh, Committee minutes uh, that Ms. Hull identified that our application is not on the ALC website. And I just wanted to clarify, did we do a different process, uh, like a written request that was something different from an application? Because there is nothing on the ALC website for any request from Souk. So I just want to follow up on whether or not they actually got our request in the hopper, because it's not on the website. So, okay. Mr. Dillabaugh? Through you, Your Worship. I don't know the technical side from the ALC side, but I can confirm that our request did go to the ALC board or commission or something along those lines, whatever the technical side of it is. As I say, I don't know. Three or four weeks ago, actually. And, I'm, and so we're still waiting to hear back what the result of that was. But yes, it has gone to them and they have considered it and we should be hearing back shortly. Thank you. Okay, so I'm wondering, um, not to put Councillor Ray and Pearson on the spot, but with your task force, I'm wondering just if there's anything that you would like to share with Council from those meetings or if you have any thoughts on this that you would like to bring forward at this time. I'm sorry, I haven't prepped you, I'm just sort of putting you on the spot, so it's fine either way. Okay. <laughs> um, no, there's been no change we were waiting to hear back from the alc to see if if there was any change to to their direction whether they were opposed to us having anything located on there whatsoever and and i guess without that we're at a impasse right without that we're at an impasse um i i, I don't know what else to say okay no that's fine um so there's a few things um we continue to wait, but then I think if we want to wait for the LC, we have to look for the extension. Um, or we put it on municipal right away. So then it doesn't, in, we're not waiting on the LC at all. We're just working on our municipal right away. So those are sort of two options, which is putting us back to where we sort of started and potentially may need an extension anyway, just given the time. Um, or we, we don't do the, we don't do it at all. So <laughs> that's sort of with the trail piece, you know, one piece there. Councilor Berger. Okay, so I still hold my same standpoint, but I have a few extra things that I'd like to add. So when I read through this again, um, I did a little bit more homework on it. Um, and if I recall, a from the last time this was at our desk with regards to the trail component, it was gonna cost the matching funds for the district was roughly $100,000. Am I correct in that? It was eight, or it might have been just over 100. The, I don't recall, the budget amount is like 77 or 78,000. I don't recall what the Okay. I didn't, I should though. have looked up previous minutes because I remember the $100,000 mark and it being sort of on the high side. Um, and which is the exact reason why I didn't support it then and I still don't support it now. I think when we look at value for our dollar, if there was no grant for us to discuss and somebody brought this to the table and said, do you support building a bike path or a multi-use path, any kind of path from Kirby Road to Souk Road and there's a $100,000 price tag attached my immediate response is no, I don't support that. I don't think that's good value for our dollar. I don't think it's the best spot to have something. I think it's a, it's, I think it's a great idea to try and direct people to the goose, but I don't think that area 
is ready yet. And I don't think that it's, for me, it's not good value. And so I still don't support that. So with the component of the BC Bike Multi-Use Trail Project, I am not in support of it. Now the second part with regards to the horseshoe pitch, and um, you guys aren't gonna like me again, <laughs> but I, 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 st I still haven't changed my mind. I think it's the wrong place. Um, and extra homework that I did again um, after Ms. Hall's previous comments at the last meeting. Now hold your seat, Ms. Hall, because I'm gonna agree with you. Um, I went on the district website, and she's absolutely right. When you search parks, it comes up as Soup River Park. You can use the park overlay, and I've got it right in front of me as well. Um, so you can find it via park on our Soup website. However, when you use the overlay of zoning and you get out of the parks tab, it comes up as RU3. So being that there's a conflict on our website, I have to... I have to lead myself to think that it still is probably RU3. And I remember we discussed this quite some time ago with we would have to go through the process of removing it as RU3 and do our own rezone to rezone it and designate it as a park. Therefore, we could do whatever we like on it. So also in front of me, I loaded up the zoning bylaw. And RU3 is small-scale agricultural. And it says the purpose of the zone is intended to provide small-scale agricultural land uses within the District of Souk. The principal use is agriculture, intense agriculture, aquaculture, and one single family dwelling or duplex. There is accessory uses and it's uses, uses um, and it talks about bed and breakfast, boarding, lodging, home-based business, one secondary suite, or a vacation accommodation. It doesn't speak to recreational lands. So from what I'm understanding within our own bylaw, RU3, <coughs> this is not a permitted use within our own bylaw. So now if I my own personal opinion like I've said to you before I, you know you guys have great ideas with your horseshoe pitch and I know that you want to grow I know that this has been scaled down yet again for you and I know that you do want to be at a larger venue so being by the fact that this is contrary to our own bylaw I'll put my personal opinions aside that you need a bigger piece of land so you can grow and succeed um, so I don't support it for that but I also can't and now I can't support it at all based on the fact that are you three doesn't allow for it and we need to go through the process I believe of rezoning this land and making it a park. Mm -hmm. We don't have a park plan for it. There's never been a park plan for it. When we purchased the land, we had great ideas of creating a great estuary type place similar to a Swan Lake. Um, and I still stand beside that that's what that piece of property should be used for. Okay, thank you, Councillor Berger. Um, Mr. Dillabaugh? Thank you, Worship. I just wanted to touch on something, and Ms. Nelson or Ms. Sprinkling can correct me if I'm wrong. You can have a park use in any zone. So it doesn't have to be zoned park. You can have a park use in any zone. Okay, but then are you still... Sorry, I'm just jumping in. Is that okay? Um, so then are you still bound, though, by your zoning bylaw? Because if, you're, if you've got it zoned as RU3 and you use park as an allowable use... But what about the other uses that are limited through our own bylaw? For example, are you three? Because if you have a park use, you could say we would allow any sort of passive recreation or we allow a walking trail or a dog park or what have you. But doesn't that sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong because I very well could be, but doesn't that sort of contradict having it actually zoned? If you could say, well, we're going to allow anything we want in a park. Good question. <laughs> uh, perhaps Ms. Sprinkling could touch on it if, if, with further detail. I'm not a planner, Your Worship, <laughs> but um, in speaking with the planning department, they have assured us that the zoning bylaw, it's in the, in the general section of the bylaw, that park uses can be in any zone. So that covers off any zone um, that uh, this, the projects would occur in. However, um, we would want to clean up our bylaw, or sorry, our zoning for that area as well, and it's certainly something on the plate if council wishes to proceed with this. So would we, we would be in, um, in compliance with the zoning bylaw to put park uses on those properties, but we would also look to um, going, getting the zoning into compliance at some point in time. It could happen concurrently with the project. Okay, um, Councillor Casper. So I, 
I, I don't want to get into the debate of whether it's in the right location, the wrong location, i.e. the trail. Um, I don't want to get into the debate about the horseshoe pitch tonight. But I think what's incumbent on us is because of timelines, no matter what we decide after hearing from the ALR, that we should approach the province to ask for an extension. That's the first point. And then the second point would to be a asking a secondary question. W would, would we get support if another trail location was recommended or sought by the municipality? Uh, be, you know, because I, th I think there's value in the 75,000. Okay, that's my opinion, okay? And, and, and then we get the deck cleared on that. And then in the meantime, we, we, we have to wait in order for fairness to everybody to hear from the land commission. Uh, yeah, that's what we agreed to, in, right? You know, we all agreed to that. So, so that's a, a given. But if we have to make a formal motion to, to carry on and still wait and then pursue what's recommended here but do an add-on that says, you know, w would they consider um, accepting a secondary location for for a trail because I, I think we we have to do these trails no matter what you know in different areas right it may not be this one this this was you know maybe if it had all its nuts and bolts in place and everything was perfect fine but, but as we progress we find out that there's all these problems so I don't know that's my suggestion for what it's worth Thank you, Councillor Casper. Councillor Pearson. Well, I concur with uh, Councillor Casper there. Um, but I still think, in, in the nail that was, was sort of hit on the head there, was that we do have to wait for that ALR ruling. We can't change it to a park because the step one is to what the ALLC says. Then we can go ahead and do whatever we want to do. Okay? The zoning is, is backwards. The way we're talking about it is backwards. Second part of it is, is that I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention, it says in here, talk about the bike trail and I think that there's you know this council has got concern about the cost being 50% and it's going to cost us an extra hundred thousand it says here it says the multi uh, two analysis subject to the approval of the agricultural anchors is to locate the multi-use trail on the park property proceed with the survey and then there's a word in here that says design but we have trail standards already so I don't think we have to design anything we don't have to spend any more money I think we I think we have the, the area if we identify the area and we use our own trail uh, <coughs> standards we can just get it built and I think that there's good value in the 75,000 as long as we don't get carried away with some engineered study and things like that that we want to build a trail a certain way we just use our own designs that are already there just put it in the right place survey it and I think we can I think we can take advantage of the 75,000 but step one is again we already agreed at the table we have a motion in place to wait until the ruling on the ALC. So if we need to proceed with an extension, well, then I have no problem making a motion to request an extension. But I think there's some things in here that we need to clean up because I think we can take care of some. I think we can take advantage of that grant. Okay. Okay. Councillor Parkinson, then Ray. As I recall, we do have a motion on um, from previous that we weren't going to proceed with this until we did hear back from the Agricultural Land Reserve. So we decided not to talk to this until we actually heard back. So I'd like to make the motion that we wait to hear. And um, if we have to apply to for an extension that we do that. But that should, like, we keep discussing it and we talk to it for half an hour and we still can't do anything about it. So I'd rather not discuss it tonight and wait till we have something to talk about. Okay, no, and I, I do agree uh, with what you're saying. There is a live motion, and it's just the reason why I brought this was because I foolishly assumed that we would have heard from the ALC by now. It's like the end of October, and this went off June, you know, and then I knew that they had received it, and then we heard that somebody had it, and then that person went on vacation, then it moved, and then it's gone to the ALC commission, and it's like, it's it's just surprising how long it took what what seemed to be a fairly 
straight up ask. So that's why in the essence of time and then clearly even if they came back and said, okay, well, yeah, go for it, then we're jeopardizing our completion date um, in terms of, you know, having something completed. So that's where it, it is right now. So I kind of hear that there was sort of a motion then. So then it's basically that council continued to, what I'm hearing is that council continued to wait for a response from the ALC and in the meantime request an extension for the grant or approach the province for an extension and to also ask if another location would be considered or accepted by the province. So if someone would like to move and second that, moved by Councillor Casper and seconded by Councillor Pearson. So the direction at this point is that we are still not going to discuss the horseshoes, the parking, or the trail until we get an answer from the LC. But in the meantime, we do need the extension. We'll see what they come back with and whether or not um, that'll just give us what our options are potentially. Councillor Ray. Uh, yes, so speaking to the motion, um, I don't support requesting the extension. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I, I think we're in a mess. Um, I know that's not particularly optimistic, um, but uh, I think it goes to what Councillor Parkinson says. Uh, there's been an ongoing dialogue for a long time, and I think uh, if we can't have our ducks in order by uh, October, the end of October, and if it's, uh, you know, there'll be other opportunities. I would rather go to the province with something that's a fulsome um, uh, suggestion that's done, gone by the, the formats that are included and required uh, rather than, than doing it this way, so I won't be supporting the motion. Okay. Feedback on the motion, Councillor Logans. I'm kind of in the same boat. I did bring up the topic of, of giving the grant back, as uh, embarrassing as that would be oh, a few months ago, I guess, maybe now. <laughs> um, but I just feel like if we, uh, uh, again, as awful as it may seem, if we get one of these three things off the table, it'll be a lot easier to deal with. Other comments on the motion? This is about getting the extension. Councillor Pearson. I'll just make the final comment. I think we have to um, acknowledge that uh, parks and trails are a good thing for the community and I think that applying for an extension in one way sends a message that we're still interested in developing bike and trails in the community. Yeah, we might be have a little bit of a schmozzle, but at least, at least we're asking for an extension and, and it, it gives a signal that we as a community are interested. So. I think that's important. Okay, other comments from councillors on the motion? I'll be supporting the motion. Um, I think that if we had had a response back, we're not sitting here going, we don't know what to do, we need more time to figure it out. We're waiting for an entity to, to respond to us. And my recollection in speaking with Mr. Howie is he was given the impression that he would hear back relatively soon and soon has turned into months. So that is our hold up. If we were sitting here going, oh, do we do this? Do we do that? Do we do this? And I know it sort of sounds like that is also the case because we still haven't fully determined about the horseshoes. We know that parking is not an allowed use, even though there was an ask for that in other areas. But in terms of the trail, council wanted the trail to go through the park and not the majority of council because it passed, okay? So maybe not all of council unanimously, the majority of council in a democratic setting wanted it through the park and now we're waiting on another entity to come back with that. So um, I'll support it and we'll see what they say and carry on from there. Councillor Ray? Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I'm not particularly concerned about going through the park area of the ALR. What I'm concerned about is getting from the goose to that point and having walked that, driven it, uh, I don't know where we're gonna put, put the trail, to be honest with you. And that's my concern. It's not the commission decision. It's that the practical of being realistic about where are you gonna put that trail from the park to the goose, I think is the issue. And, I, and I'd be very surprised um, that it will be an easy process. So that's why I'm not supporting it. It's not just the commission. Okay. 
Any other discussion on the motion? I'll call the question then. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Councillor Logans, Berger, and Ray are opposed. Would you like your votes recorded? Yes, and motion carries. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your patience, gentlemen. We will keep you apprised. Uh, next item of business, NB3, on page 53, is the SUC program. On new, in MB3, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's where I'm going. Yeah, so this is the report of in-camera resolutions from October 13th, regular council meeting, the SUC program of the Arts Committee appointments. Um, Councillor Parkinson, since you are the li liaison, did you want to? Okay, so the, the motion is um, basically, or what we're rising on is it, it was moved and seconded that council appoint the following mem persons as members of the SUC program of the Arts Committee for 2015 and 2016. Um, Lorna Cosper, Drew Johnston, Frederick Philippe, John David Russell, and Bob Tully. And further that council release its these appointments to the public. So that is our report of in-camera resolutions. Councillor Parkinson. And I would just like to add to that that we also have a member from the Souk Arts Council sitting on that committee, as okay. well as um, a museum member. So they will also be joining the committee. Great, thank you very much, Councillor Parkinson. And so that brings us back to Correspondence for information. So C1, sorry, is the public submissions received regarding the BC ambulance response times. And there's a motion to receive from Councillor Casper, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Uh, was there any dialogue or request to send any written response back this time or just receiving? Okay, Councillor Ray. I uh, guess I, I noticed that uh, we had uh, three um, letters coming in, I believe the count was. And there's uh, an, another one. Right, that yeah. we just received tonight. I just want to make the comment that, uh, you know, getting, and we've had this before where there's this copy and paste. Um, I just like to say that if people are really opposed to something or they want something, that it would be helpful if, if people could write their own letter. Uh, you know, the last time round, I, I can't remember how many we had, and then you start to realize there, somebody just copy and pasted them all. So, it, just, a, <laughs> just a comment. All right, motion to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Um, okay. I-1 is correspondence received September 19, 2015, from the Vancouver Island Regional Library Board. It's a press release that the Library Board adopts a balanced 2016 operating budget. Motion to receive by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Ray. Councillor Ray is our appointee. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make about the library or the budget? Uh, no, thank you, Your Worship. I made the comments about the, uh, the interest. Uh, it might have been at the last meeting that you weren't at. So okay, thanks. thank you very much. All those in favor, receive. Opposed, motion is carried. I too, correspondence received October 1st from the BC Lottery Corporation regarding the B, L, pardon me, BCLC's plans for the Greater Victoria Marketplace. Councillor Casper. Well, I think um, that, that, that uh, we should actually respond to this mm -hmm. um, because uh, it, it could potentially have an impact on the on the existing operation and the revenue sharing mechanism that's currently in place. And I read a editorial piece that was put together by, I think, the mayors of Colwood, Langford, and Beer Royal on this matter. Mm -hmm. And I think we should lend our support to the positions taken by those those municipalities and maybe. If we can get a copy of that editorial that they, uh, it was a letter to the editor in the Times Colonist, um, you know, I would support you sending a letter to that effect. Councillor Ray? I'm just wondering, uh, given that there could be, a, could be a, a significant impact on our revenue coming in as a budget, perhaps maybe we could ask for just a short staff report in terms of what that 
could be in terms of revenue. I don't know, Mr. Dillabaugh, is that something that would be reasonable or would it be just a guessing game? At this stage, I'm, I'm not certain. I can certainly look into it and if if the motion goes forward, we can certainly attach that to it as, as part of the backup. So what we could, because this has been brought up that the current, what I understand is the, ver the V-Royal um, facility wants to do expansion and all the like and that's why adding a second one into another area there's concern that there's not enough to support two facilities so it's going to drain one or the other and that there should be just support flowing out to the one so perhaps um, there's two options we can either just send the letter or did you want something to come back maybe with a copy of that information and then whatever Mr. Dillabaugh can put together with the letter or you just want the letter to go out Mr. Councillor Ray, I, I don't feel comfortable endorsing something that I don't fully understand sure. or what the what the issues are. So it, it it can be very brief. We you know which I prefer anyhow. But I just if I'm going to endorse something, I'd like to have a good sense of what I'm endorsing. Yeah. So perhaps then a motion could be to direct staff to create a short report um, to re obtain some information from View Royal. I think uh, Mayor Screech was the one that was really sort of um, that took that lead on and just to come back with council with something and then we can have a draft letter of support for V Royal and the West Shore community attached, not for not a letter of support to the BCLC for their second entity. Okay, so would someone like to move that motion? Moved by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Casper. Well, it'll either be in November. Is that reasonable? Well, that's why the, the soon, you know as soon as possible, you know, we'll have something. It, it doesn't have to be anything, but I think if we can get a copy of the editorial, and I think the View Royal staff will likely have that, it, it'll be just very quick and draft something up. Because I do agree. Um, <coughs> Uh, it, in terms of, I agree with what councillors are saying in terms of having, I don't want to see a second facility, so. Okay, any clarity or questions on the motion? All those in favor, opposed, carried unanimously, thank you. And I three is correspondence received October 8th from the BC Ministry of Community Sport Cultural Development regarding the Asset Management Strategy Grant. Uh, we applied for this, I don't know if it was last year or the year before perhaps, um, and we have received the grant for this initiative. So basically just looking for a motion to receive. Moved received by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Logans. Any comments or questions about the motion? All those in favor, opposed, motions carried. I-4 is the Councillor Reader file for September 2015. Moved received by Councillor Berger, seconded by Councillor Logans. <coughs> Any questions on the reader file? Staff have been sending it out electronically so that everyone has it. Is that working for everybody? Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, staff, for doing that as well. Um, all those in favor of receipt? Opposed? Motions carried. Thank you. And I believe that brings us... I actually jumped and put the report of in-camera resolutions ahead of where they were supposed to be, so my apologies. So in that case... We're going to adjourn, take a short recess, and then we just have to move back in camera. So, motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn by Councillor Ray, seconded by Councillor Logans. All those in favour, opposed? Just take a few minutes here. Thank you.